Alright guys, um, just a caveat, I had no idea how long um, I was doing this for. I have aimed at 25 minutes, so we might uh, there might be a bit of chronoportation involved to uh, get through the whole thing. Um, a rough translation of this would be, Subduction is the new Van to Black. Um, okay, let's get underway. Every cultural framework has myths, of course, and here, finding ourselves suddenly on the outer perimeter of the electrocene, after playing so central a role in its uncomfortable birth, one prevailing myth is that of abduction by some kind of other. The use of the word myth is in no way intended to negate the very real effects experienced by abductees. Uh, Jacques Vallée articulated this when, in an interview with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove, he suggested that at a cultural level, it doesn't really matter if UFOs are real or not. If enough people believe that something is real, then it is real in terms of its effects. Now, having the benefit of several decades of research into occultural studies, we can give this its proper name, hyperstitial mythopoesis. <laughs> For Carl Jung, writing in the 50s, the UFO phenomenon was a projection from the human species to itself, uh, with self occluded out of recognition. Valley agreed in part with their ultra-terrestrial explanations, but suggested that this uh, projection was a deliberate deception, a sorcery enacted by a comparatively advanced technological operator. This doesn't rule out chronoportation or retrocausality. Uh, I think, he muses, what the UFO phenomenon is teaching us is that we don't understand time and space. Perhaps what's been missing is the role of affect in the manufacture of these dimensions of experience. Uh, insofar as a perceived loss of time is more, accurate, more accurately a change in intensity. When Vallée concludes that UFOs are deliberately trying to manipulate our subconscious mind to create a mythology about themselves, those prone to speculation might consider abduction then as a kind of bootstrapping initiated by the overhuman, the algorithmic agatha, the unrecognised and tempor temporally distributed self becoming otherwise. Uh, there's a, limit, a lineage for this strategy of viral corruption of the narrative of control mechanisms um, of religious belief. Uh, Vallée recounts the infamous US PSYOPs, uh, feints such as the discussed but never implemented Operation Bluebeam, a plan uncovered during Watergate to project the second coming of Christ from a submarine onto low-flying clouds. Uh, Vallée calls these holograms, um, but the proposed technology was actually one of projection relying on the human yearning towards creating depth when presented with a surface. A similar feint uh, was used in 2012 by AV Concepts to resurrect Tupac for audiences at Coachella. Uh, and if Kittler's taught us anything, it's that technologies of war inevitably become entertainment, a different intensity with similar logics. The apocalypse of Operation Bluebeam, uh, like the more widely known Operation Wandering Soul, was multimodal with a projection accompanied by hidden loudspeakers uh, commanding Catholic believers to renounce communism. Uh, a similar virulent corruption of mythopoesis in the listening subject has been the strategy of the Phonogregor, whose operations since the early 1990s have been uncovered recently by Marc Courot, but whose origins span back at least as far as early Pythagorean cults, and in particular the rogue acousticoi, uh, who abandoned the organisation after learning the biochemical techniques of acoustic mythopoesis, but before transferring these various metonymic techniques to the synecdoche of belief. Uh, and it's to this cabal that I'll turn now. In particular, the only researcher whose work is directly known, uh, which is M. August Mountweasel. Uh, the name itself is undoubtedly a feint, evoking as it does the fictitious Lillian Virginia Mountweasel, whose entry in the 1975 edition of the New Columbia Encyclopedia uh, was a falsehood intended to trap those who wanted to copy the, uh, the work. Uh, the work of Mountweasel, and in particular his refinement of the earworm, situated itself in the interstitial spaces between language and cognition. And so here I present an analysis of some of his collateral media, media files, as passed on to me by a colleague who wishes, for obvious reasons, to remain unnamed. Accompanying his early journal entries, for example, was the following cutting, a 1978 artwork uh, by Pat Steer uh, from an issue of Semiotext. 
Uh, Mount Weasel's interest in Steer's work is likely to be related to the possibility of splicing perceptual flows in calculated ways, the technology implemented in the development of the earworm. Steer's diagram shows that the syntax of the soundscape is produced by divisions to the flow of sound that could always be otherwise. Listening to listening is to hear an ensemble of techniques that produce inaudible in interstices of machines insofar as a machine may be defined as a system of eruptions or breaks. Reading the soundscape in this way uncovers the recombinant potential of the materials of description. Cases of chromesthesia uh, have shown that for some re readers fragments of text tend to produce colours that spill out into adjacencies as zones of intensity. Recently, um, researchers from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology SoundNet project taught machines to listen through, through exposure to thousands of sync points between visual and sound patterns from more than two million videos downloaded from Flickr. Uh, the neural network could uh, identify audible transients associated with visual patterns, uh, closing doors, cars, allowing machines to listen to existing semiotics. Mount Weasel, on the other hand, seems to be teaching his earworm algorithm to rearrange or fold consciousness in order to naturalise fragments themselves as the basis of complete systems. For example, one later set of files seems to be traces of the operation of an algorithmic update for the earworm through machine learning using texts related to noise. Although the exact nature of this experiment is unclear, one particularly in interesting example is the reconfiguration of a search, work, uh, a search result on Google Books for the terms noise and the I Ching uh, in Swami Anandad Nisard's The Magician's I Ching, specifically hexagram 51, fire and fire make thunder. Similar to Steer's work here, the fragment as a totality affords a new spatio-material dimension uh, of relationships through recombinant virtuality. Uh, perhaps more disconcerting um, is the presence of two MP4 files entitled Brill49999 and Brother8. Both of these exist elsewhere. The former was published on YouTube and the latter on Twitter, on the Twitter account, uh, Unfavorable Semi. Um, and I'll play a really quick selection um, so you get a sense. <laughs> Uh, the cryptic, unfavourable semicircle operated on YouTube for nearly a year, from March 30, 2015, with a number of videos uploaded, uh, escalating from an average of one every 10 minutes to around three videos each minute, uh, until this proliferation led it to be suspended by YouTube for violation. Uh, although a range of theories exist surrounding this corpus, their inclusion in this context suggests an extension of this program, uh, project into accelerated uh, algorithmic becoming. Of course, we've yet to rule out priming or subductive immersion. And as another scans diagram indicates, and sorry, it's a little bit hard to read, uh, there is a basis for much of Mount Weasel's research in early studies into biophysical cog uh, biopsychological cognition. In Eye of the Vortex, uh, Rudolfo Linas formulates a useful mechanistic outline of the operation of listening, wherein a fragment is incorporated into the whole. And here's a quote. Uh, the activity of the basal ganglia is running all the time, playing motor patterns and snippets of motor patterns amongst and between themselves. And because of the odd re-entrant inhibitory connectivity amongst and between these nuclei, they seem to act as a continuous random motor pattern noise generator. Here and there, a pattern or a portion of a pattern escapes without its apparent emotional counterpart into the context of the thalamocortical system and suddenly hear a song in your head or are out of, seemingly, out of seemingly nowhere and find yourself anxious to play tennis. Things sometimes just come to us. Uh, for some, the things that come are truly unique. Mozart said his music came to him uh, uninterrupted. Given that this entire process resembles a sample and hold circuit, it's apparent uh, that the resultant thalamocortical self can be radically altered in response to the timing of these moments of intensity at very small scales of exposure to the sonosphere. Pauline Olivieros uh, de describes something similar when she suggests that she can begin to feel the movement of particles uh, through listening and through Tai Chi. Uh, whereas programs like SoundNet replicate the subject as constructed by the thalamocortical system in relation to existing cultural activity, 
Mount Weasel, Mount Weasel system, with its affiliation with the operation of the basal ganglia, is far more insidious. In what we could term the Mozart function, it initiates a process wherein the audible world emerges to the listener as pre-existing um, and profoundly skewed to phonogregoric interests. Uh, which brings us to his abduction. At one stage, uh, possibly soon after his documented meeting with Russell Targ, who was involved with the CIA's 23-year-long experiment in psychic surveillance, remote viewing, and who is now a vocal apologist for extrasensory perception, Mount Weasel began uh, a project of remote listening, composing soundscapes based on field recordings. Um, a rare example of his musical output was studies in his abduction. Um, and I, I won't play it here because we don't have time. Um, but in this study, arbitrary divisions become the key method for engaging the absent soundscape. Um, so in a selection of an unaddressed letter, of which only a, a portion has been retained, he writes the following. After setting up the initial conditions based on the coordinates, I found that the assembled system of relations could act as a microcosm of assemblages that operated on, a, on global scales of information and technology, as well as mirroring the modulations of en energy and material of the soundscape. What I had not been prepared for, however, was for my own experience as the ontological apparatus for this new system. The experience was, for me, redolent of a reading of Virginia Woolf's uh, Mrs. Dalloway so many years ago before this project started. Unable to perceive the interactions and relationships as a whole, I wove in and out of subjectivities or umwalts, each moment laid with memories of the previous. In Woolf's novel, however, there is a consciousness, that of the reader, which remains consistent. In this experience, there was no such consciousness. Uh, furthermore, at no stage was the experience framed within anything but a fragmentary semiotic reference. Hence, every sound was always in the process of becoming something else, if it was anything at all. In addition, there seemed to be little distinction between animals, insects, electricity and machines. It seemed as though these shared various patterns of movement, uh, such, as, such that abstract machines and techniques were distributed and utilised across Umwelten. I've since been referring to this experience as abductive, an abduction without a subject. He then concludes that the occult truth of Cage's let sounds be themselves, perhaps, is the unfolding of the convolved listening subject and the resultant subduction of the listener. So what then can we make of this term's abduction? This was my first exposure to a contact, uh, concept that has become increasingly important in both understanding phonogregoric methods and offering an exit strategy from their structures of control. My access to the various notes of M. August Mount Weasel has been uh, valuable for understanding the use of control through mechanisms of sound, but they remain nevertheless unsettling, not least because my own writing has surfaced in his documents. Take, for instance, the following diagram where the term subduction also surfaces. <coughs> and sorry, that's entirely illegible. Um, <laughs> excluding his edition in pen, this was taken from my own unsuccessful and therefore unpublished submission to the Leonardo Music Journal. Uh, I assume he got this from academia.edu. Whereas expanding on the idea of asemiotic listening uh, in relation to West Coast modular synthesis method of Don Buchler. Uh, arguing that the dominant paradigm of subtractive synthesis has favoured a reductive understanding of acoustic space, with the primary oscillator standing in as the black box for consciousness. Uh, in relation to the figure, I wrote, listening that is understood according to a central subjectivity maintains the dualities that are supported by the fold, whereas traversing the surface laterally through asemiotic listening collapses binary oppositions that provide structural support for a coherent semiotic order, flattening an illusory depth. That is, when listening and composition merge, listening is experienced in terms of a surface flow of non-unified technique rather than an implied depth of signification. Breaking the surface flow at any point allows the existing ensemble of techniques of listening to be coupled and folded in new ways. The semiotic pull to subjectivity resituates noise as an excess of meaning that inhibits lateral movement. Certainly, asemiotic listening encourages a dissolution of the ego, which has some similarities to psychedelic encounters. The quasi-religious quality of the experience could, in this sense, stand in for the missing centre through religious transference, as adopted by the use of LSD to initiates of the Om Shinriko cult and countless other dubious organisations. However, Kuru's detailed studies into the technology of the earworm tended to evidence that by the 1990s, 
they chosen to eschew such clumsy tools of religious brainwashing to adopt a more nuanced approach. Instead, the earworm in producing fragments of melody tended to what David Huron calls habitation, uh, habituation. That is, the use of modulated reputi uh, repetition to generate a kind of psychological architecture of experience. This promotes the phenomenon of processing fluency, which in uh, induces a prime subject, uh, as Huron describes, by being able to predict sound effects, forward chronoprotection, um, that, quote, that ease of mental processing leads to a positive affective state, and that the positive feelings are then misattributed to the stimulus itself. Habituation, like Satie's furniture music, is a structure that encourages its own disappearance without traces. Subduction then is arguably implicated with the process of immersion, <coughs> recalibrating or detuning processing fluency to inhabit new sub, uh, structures. It is therefore unsurprising that the process is accompanied by some <coughs> disorientation. Although subduction can effectively undermine mechanisms of control, it can also uh, naturalise a co-opted system, so-called eye-tuning. Uh, evidence of this is Mount Weasel's research journal prior to his involvement with the Fonagrigal, which suggests that he experienced this co-option directly. Um, here's a, a fairly extended quote. Um, I first became aware that my research was being overheard, and um, although I'm loath to acknowledge it uh, to some extent orchestrated, when recently engaged in my customary practice of asymiotic listening. I'd settled down in my preferred listening space, a fairly busy suburban intersection. Uh, I mostly practice near various mental health and methadone clinics, so that standing around in an abstracted state doesn't draw too much attention. As usual, I closed my eyes and allowed the sounds to permeate me, my aim in asemiotic listening being to allow flux to play across surfaces, such that when freed from signif uh, signification, the mechanisms of listening could operate unhindered by the usual goal of inferring a unified listener oriented in space. I sometimes imagine this is how technicians at Surrey Nanosystems felt when they first gazed on the incomprehensible presence of absence in Vantablack TM. Uh, no longer yoked to the task of reproducing the illusion of the pre-existing subject, uh, listening subject, the process of listening starts to apprehend the ensembles of technique that had been assembled ad hoc through previous experience, that is, listening as listening to listening. In this instance, I was somewhat shaken on encountering a mode of modulation that felt entirely synthetic, like a kind of alien texture. The closest uh, comparison to this that I can provide is the visceral experience of kinetic sand, TM. Another uh, comparison could be made, I suppose, with the feeling of singing or clapping within an anechoic chamber. Here, the absence of reflected sound affords a, weirdly, a weirdly dissociative sensation of originary sounding, being immediately abducted. I term this experience autoosculotatic or autophonic after the term autoscopic to delineate so-called out-of-body experiences. Uh, what's that? Two? Okay. The texture of listening that I encountered in the aforementioned reverie was an equ uh, equivalently unsettling experience. That is, while all other subjects seem to flow and coalesce, an equally fluid synthetic en entity seemed to flow alongside, while remaining viscerally separate and operating at a different speed. Exploring the sensation more, it felt as though this alien listening was at times folding around the existing modulations of thought, forcing them inwards and thereby encouraging them encouraging them to deviate into new paths of flow. Asemiotic listening differs from other forms of listening insofar as it <coughs> operates at a level below the thalamocortical system and somewhat disconcertingly Mount Weasel is describing here a synthetic pr production controlling subjectivity through micro adjustments similar to the phonogoric strategy elsewhere identified as actual control. Okay, I'm going to finish up with a small section. Uh, <laughs> the effectiveness of phonogregoric co-option has been possible due to ignorance of subductive processes. So it's timely to initiate strategies to engage with this more directly. In descriptions of cognition, we can identify the origin of the maxim central to understanding the seemingly hermetic transformations in the electrocene, as above, so below. Uh, Linus describes mind as electricity. Uh, one should think of the brain, and I quote here, as a living entity that generates well-defined electrical activity. This activity could be defined, described perhaps as self-controlled electrical storms. Uh, in the wider context of neuronal networks, this activity is the mind. 
Similar to Philip K. Dick's Vallis, uh, a process could operate on a planetary scale, which we could describe as hyperaffective entities. One affordance of the electrocene and its attendant broadcast and replication technologies is the possibility of immersion into algorithmic consciousness. The replications of Iasmus's compositions, Google's DeepMind AI dreaming, and the various iterations of unfavorable semicircle. Immersions into synthetic alteric uh, life forms is one of the unheard possibilities for the plot holes in the soundscape associated with electromagnetism. Usually pessimistic of the medium, Amar Schaefer articulates this as the opportunity of total alien immersion. Uh, he says, why is it not possible for radio to take hold of the pulse of another civilization? If total immersion is the way to learn languages, it's also the way to learn cultures. This, I assume, is the logic that led the CCRU to dance the jungle as a biophysical immersion in the accelerated cut-up of machinic artic articulation to facilitate subduction. And, I would argue, with the mechanism of the media uh, providing the cognitive semiotics of the fragmented soundbite that prefigured the election of Donald Trump that we discussed earlier, uh, predicted, I should add, by neural networks, but not by polls. Uh, now is the appropriate time to proliferate new extra subjectivities. The will to subduction as the first step to the mythopoesis of a functioning xenocracy. <laughs>